Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Connecting Kids to Coverage Strategies for Building Media Relationships to Expand Medicaid and CHIP Outreach Efforts. My name is Erin Seidler, and I'm working closely with the Connecting Kids to Coverage team to support the enrollment of more children and parents in free or low-cost health care coverage. Developing close relationships with local and non-traditional media outlets is an important tool to increase awareness of Medicaid and children's health insurance coverage. Reaching out to broad and diverse media outlets to share enrollment information and success stories can drive attention and eligible families and children to your work. By creating and implementing a successful media strategy, you can share key messages and calls to action, such as eligibility criteria and important enrollment information with your key audiences. Our webinar today will provide you with tips and best practices about how you to create and foster productive relationships with media outlets in order to expand the reach of your enrollment work. In just a moment, Kathleen Connors de Laguna, thank you, sorry about that, Kathleen, uh, lead for uh, Native American and Alaska Native Outreach and Enrollment Grants for the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services will walk us through the agenda to get started. Thank you, and I'll pass this over to Kathleen. Kathleen? Great. Thank you, Erin, and good afternoon to everyone else, From at least good afternoon from where I'm sitting here in Baltimore. Um, today, I'm very excited to be with you, and I want to have a special shout-out to all my grantees that have joined us on the phone. We understand that um, over 300 people have registered for this call, and so we want to thank you very, very much for joining us today for what we know, or what I hope, will be a very informative webinar for you. And our speakers will be covering various strategies, as Erin mentioned, that we hope each of you and your organizations will be able to use to get the coverage that you need to promote your efforts and find those children who are um, eligible for Medicaid or CHIP but not currently enrolled in these programs. And we also want others to know how to find your program or the assisters in the community to help get them in enrolled. So as you can see from the agenda slide, we really have a full day. We'll be touching on diverse media outlets that you might not be as familiar with, such as blogs and specialty media. And we want to leave some time for your, que your questions at the end of the presentation. So now let me take you through the agenda real quick. Um, first, we'll hear from Fleischman Hillel, who will be providing us tips on strengthening media relations efforts. And then we'll be followed by a speaker from Enroll America who will share their strategies and successes on reaching minority communities throughout diverse media outlets, including specialty media. That will be followed by um, one of my colleagues, a public uh, affairs officer from CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP Services, and she will share how to engage with regional media and your regional CMS office as well. Next. We'll have the executive director of the Family Healthcare Foundation who will speak about opportunities to leverage earned media placements to increase Medicaid and CHIP enrollment. And finally, we'll be hearing from She Knows Media blogger about engaging non traditional media to reach new audiences. We'll close with an update on the Back to School Toolkit and additional resources that we have available for you from the Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign. And then we'll take your questions at the end of the webinar. So um, please feel free throughout to um, engage, use the chat box and send us your questions so we'll be able to address them. So now I'd like to go to the next slide. Thank you. And we have a, um, a poll question where we'd like all of you to participate. And the question is, have you worked with non-traditional media outlets in your outreach efforts like specialty news outlets and blogs. You can submit your vote by clicking on an answer that's on your screen, and um, we will look forward to start seeing your answers coming up right now. So let us know, do you want to hear these tips and best practices we'll be sharing, or are you just looking to build up these relationships? Okay, there's, here's our results coming. So it looks like most of you are looking to build these relationships with non-traditional media outlets in your efforts. So thank you very much to those of you who answered the poll. And um, now we'd like to um, move forward. Uh, I'll hand it back to Erin so we can move forward with the presentation. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And thanks again for everybody for joining and participating. 
Our first speaker today is Adam Silverstein. Adam is the Vice President in the Healthcare Group at Fleischmann Hillard. Adam, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, everybody, for uh, having me on this call. It's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you today, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So what I'll be talking about is the, the fundamentals of how to think like a journalist as you build relationships with them, whether that's um, a television reporter, a radio reporter, a print journalist, or um, people who are working almost exclusively online or in other newer forms of media that you may not have previously had as much exposure to. Um, so one of the things that I always find helpful in kind of describing media is that um, you should think of it as a, as a relationship with um, the same way you would think of a relationship with anybody else. Uh, trust in relationships with the media, just like your husband or wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, brother or sister, is earned and not granted. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Um, relationships with, with your siblings or with your romantic partners, they, they don't just happen um, overnight. So you certainly wouldn't go on a, on a date without knowing a few things about the person's interests. And I think it's really important to approach reporters the same way, meaning that the first time that you email a reporter or even the second time or the third time, it's great just to introduce yourself, to say and acknowledge that you know what they write about, to say that you've read an article, to say that you've enjoyed it, and to give them a little bit of information about yourself too. Uh, those emails in and of themselves are, are kind of like um, going on a date in, in a way. Um, and one of the things that I do really stress and, and probably can't stress enough is that reporters um, are very self-conscious. They, they want to be loved. They want to know that um, reporters, they like compliments on their work, especially on social media, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so next slide, please. So in your case, um, it's also helpful to think about news value, meaning if I'm a reporter and I'm getting hundreds of emails every day from people, what is it that separates the story? What is it that really makes your email valuable to me to open it, to read it, to get back to you, and hopefully to devote the resources that are going to be needed um, in order to actually write that story? Um, and in your case, I think it's really important to remember that that your news is is valuable because it's it's local and that means that the most valuable reporters are those whose whose job it is to cover local news um, because it's affecting people in a certain location and because the stories that you tell them are also um, relevant to their readers uh, the other thing that I always think is helpful to keep in mind is that health is really really diverse and it can be covered in uh, basically an unlimited number of ways. So knowing the angles you have and matching them to the right reporter is essential. Um, so that, by that I mean if there's a reporter at a local newspaper who covers pharmaceutical companies because there are a lot of them in that geographic area, that's probably not the, the right target. Um, what you would want to find is somebody who's really tied to the community, the way people are feeling, the way they, they receive health insurance coverage, um, more uh, lifestyle health than, than business. Uh, so again, it's just essential to know the angles that you have and find the reporter who's going to match them. Um, and then I think the other thing is, and this is related to, to doing your homework, it's looking for the, the gaps. So if you go back and can read um, five or six interviews of the reporters uh, written for a newspaper or that they've filed for a website or that they've um, put online from a radio program, um, what, what isn't the reporter covering that you think they should be? Um, and how can you fill that gap? Um, so let's go to the uh, next slide. And one other thing to keep in mind is that in addition to uh, health being able to be covered in so many different ways, um, the story that you tell and the assets that you offer to reporters uh, are going to differ depending on the, the news outlet that you're pitching. So you can see from the title of the slide that the medium really defines the message. Um, so when you think about television, 
Um, television, for example, is one of the most resource intensive mediums for a news story, meaning that in addition to being able to pitch a reporter on a story, you need to convince that reporter that they should take that story to a producer, that that producer should assign a camera crew, and that that camera crew should be coming um, to to your um, place of business or wherever the interview is going to take place and dedicate a team of people to film it. So whenever you're pitching TV, I always think it's helpful if you actually have some things that will make their job easier. So if you have some really high quality videos of um, a parent or a child telling a story that helps that reporter picture what it would look like when it's on the air for their viewers, um, that's really important. So the more um, video footage that you already have at the ready to give these reporters, um, the better. Um, also, TV relies upon uh, upon people and being able to visualize and actually see those people on the air. So it is important to have your spokespeople at the ready, whether that's uh, somebody from your organization or a parent or a physician or a patient. Um, now, radio is, is a little bit different because obviously you can't see what the person is saying in the in the studio or on the, the uh, taped segment that's being broadcasted on a radio station. Um, so that is going to be really important that when you send that reporter an email, you're offering them great storytelling um, because having a great storyteller is what makes a radio program worth listening to. Uh, I mean, think about podcasts that you might enjoy or radio programs that you might programs that you may listen to on your drive to work, um, they're really great because they're telling stories and the person has something that's, that's captivating to say. Um, and then newspapers, uh, you know, we used to think of them only in terms of print and um, coming out the next day, but now uh, newspapers really tend to combine a lot of elements of both TV and radio. If you go online to a lot of news websites or print newspaper websites, I should say, um, you'll see more and more that they have podcasts, that they have online interviews, that they have um, video footage too. Um, but the thing to keep in mind about newspapers is that um, facts and figures drive the story and it's the most in-depth medium. So it really allows for the most analysis of any story. So the more facts, the more figures, the more statistics and evidence that you can provide when you send that news story to a reporter, the more likely the the journalist will be um, to see how that story could play out when he or she actually writes it. Uh, so just, just in some, um, whether it's radio, TV, or newspapers, the end story that you want to tell, the messages that you want to see in that, in, um, that coverage will all be the same. But thinking through the approach and the type of medium that you're pitching is is very important. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so just to end with a few tips for success when you're pitching reporters, and we've talked about a lot of these, but um, choose the right reporter, know what they write, and that ties directly into number two, which is really to thoroughly read the reporter's articles. Um, know what they're writing, acknowledge what they're writing, and appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, three, going back to the slide that I was uh, discussing on how you change your approach slightly depending on the uh, type of news outlet that you're pitching, um, have great assets, do your homework up front, um, and have the, the story be what drives the coverage. Um, the messages that you put into the story will, will come through once you show them how powerful it is. Um, the, the fourth thing is Pitch the reporter at the right time. Um, reporters are, just like all of us, very deadline driven, and sometimes it's going to be difficult for them to talk or to answer email. Um, and this is more of a trial and error thing than anything else, but keep notes on the reporters you pitch. Uh, if you notice that they tend to email you in the mornings within an hour of you emailing back, make note of that. If, if you're not getting a response or if you've called them before and they don't pick up the phone or if their voicemail says, please don't leave me voicemail, uh, know the best way of reaching that reporter. Um, and then five is 
respect the reporter's right to decide whether to cover. Remember that reporters have so many demands placed upon them these days, uh, probably more than at any time before because of how many newsroom jobs have evaporated and how much competition there's been in the news industry. Um, so do follow up, do be diligent about trying to get feedback, um, but don't question the reporter if they decide that at this time the story is not the right one for them. It's, uh, it's about building long-term relationships and trust with that person. Uh, and then lastly, on email on the phone, get straight to the point. The shorter that you can be, um, the better. And I've even had some success um, actually complimenting and building relationships with reporters on Twitter and actually pitching them on Twitter and saying, hey, I have a great story for you, going to email you now, um, can really help get their, get their attention. Um, so th those are the tips for success when pitching reporters. And I believe, unless I have another slide, that may be my last one. So um, thank you again for letting me speak with you all. Great. Thank you so much, Adam, for jumping on the call with us today um, and sharing those tips. Our next speaker is Annette Ravineau. Annette is the National Director of Media Partnerships at Enroll America. Annette, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, Sorry about that. Slide, to be, yeah, I apologies. There appears to be a delay. There you go. All right. Well, um, we're going to be talking about reaching minority communities through diverse media outlets. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about what Enroll America is. So Enroll America created the Get Covered America campaign in 2013 to inform millions of eligible consumers about their new health insurance options. We are an independent nonprofit, nonpartisan organization who works with more than 6,700 partners, hopefully some of you are one of those, um, in all 50 states to create cutting-edge tools, analyze data, inform policy, and share best practices in the service of our mission, which is to maximize the number of Americans who enroll in and retain health coverage under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I am Annette Ravenel, I'm the National Director of Media Partnerships, as Erin said, and um, I've been working in healthcare nonprofits now for five years, and prior to that, I worked as a reporter and producer for Univision Network, which is the number one Spanish language network in the country. Next slide. So this is our agenda. It takes two to tango. I need to tango with you guys, so I have two polls, um, questions that I have for you. Um, if you please just answer those, um, I'll give you around 15 seconds, 20 seconds to answer those, and then we can move on to the, to, um, to the presentation. Um, so in the agenda, we're going to be talking about the challenges that we have when we're trying to reach and have a relationship with um, constituency media. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to build that relationship and then how to maintain that relationship, um, very similar to what Adam was saying. This is like the dating game. We need to make sure that, that our date is happy. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about you know, sharing best practices, determine uh, how to determine your spokesperson, creating that media list, because after you've done everything, how do you actually reach the media? And of course, um, we'll give you some tools so Enroll America could help you in anything that you need when it comes to communication. Next slide. So this is our first poll question. Um, so please just click um, when, it, when it prompts you. What are your challenges when you're communicating with constituency media or specialty media? Is it A, language as a barrier? Is that your, your, your challenge with them? Um, do they ask for money every time you want them to cover a story? Um, and do they, um, do they say that they're coming to your event, they promise they're coming to the, and then they're total no-shows? Uh, one of these um, might be something that's close to your experience. Please click on one, and then we'll see the results. All right. So for most of you, they are asking for advertising dollars. That That is definitely uh, an issue um, with, with constituency media. And um, the second highest was, that they say that they're going to come to your event and then they don't show, and then language a barrier to some of you, but definitely the majority would be the advertising dollars. Okay, next slide. Thank you for answering, by the way. Okay, well, 
definitely the advertising dollars is a huge issue, mainly with the really small, let's say, like um, weekly by weekly um, print, radio, I mean, TV. It really, it's just, it's all over the place. They all are trying to get money, and, and that's understandable, but that is a big issue when we don't have money to pay them. Next slide, please. Hi, Annette. Apologies again. We're on a bit of a delay. Just one moment. No there problem. We go. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Well, these are things to think about, um, and I'm going to address um, the answers on, on the poll. So things to think about, definitely emailing them, letting them know of the event. Um, um, phone calls could be good. Text if you have their cell phone number and you feel that um, they are not um, getting back to you. It's good just to be like, hey, I text, I, I, I sent you a press release or I sent you an email about this event that we're having. Um, please check your, your junk mail or your trash mail. Um, other partners might be good to solve the problem of, um, of them not coming to you um, or them asking for advertising dollars. Maybe there's a partner of yours that does give them money. And if they have this relationship that they would be able to just reintroduce you to them, that could be a good opportunity for you to cash in on that. Um, reaching out to multiple people in, in the outlets. One of the things that have happened to us is that, for instance, I went to um, a Univision station um, in one of the states, and when we talked to the news people, we said we were going to meet with them, and when I show up, it's somebody from the news department and somebody from the sales department, and they're so eager to talk to me. And it's, it's something that maybe their superiors um, pressure them to do that every time they're going to have a meeting and they think there's money that they could make. They always bring that salesperson. So um, it's always good to just, yes, be polite, um, but always try to reach other people in the newsroom. So if the reporter met with you or the even the news director met with you or the assignment desk, anybody from the, from the news outlet met with you, including the salesperson, always good to um, start reaching out to other people, the producer or the producer for the weekend show instead of the producer for the weekly, uh, nightly show. Um, that would be able to hopefully help you in expanding your contacts. Um, and then you might not get a lot of play, but you might just get that one, one story in. Um, letting also, when they're not showing up, one of the things that I remember when I, I used to live in Las Vegas, and one of the things that I remember as a reporter for, for the Univision station there is that um, we would get invited to go to an event, and then when we would show up, there was absolutely nothing, nothing related to the Latino community. So no spokesperson spoke Spanish. They didn't have uh, a real, a quote-unquote, real success story or a real-life story that spoke Spanish. So then it's like, this does not look like it relates to our community, even though it did, if it had, I don't know, maybe it would have been politics, or maybe it would have had um, something to do with health, or regardless of what it was, um, at least for the Spanish-speaking um, um, outlet, they, they definitely want somebody that, that maybe not looks like them, but somebody that speaks their language or could relate to, to their um, community. So when you have had a, uh, an event and they have not shown up, try to want to see if you are um, offering that they, that they have somebody that speaks the language that, that you're trying to reach in that community. And if you do, when you're pitching the, the press release or you're pitching the story, make sure you let them know, by the way, we have a, we have a, a Spanish speaker or Urdu speaker, um, you know, the language that that, that, that that community speaks let them know that you do have a person that will be able to communicate with them and give them an interview. And also, um, offering exclusive interviews could work. Um, and when I say ex exclusive, I don't, I don't mean like call everybody and let them know, hey, I have an exclusive, but um, keep offering the same one. Don't do that. I, I really do mean to offer exclusives to them. Um, so maybe they'll be interested in that. I will give you, again, an example with, um, let's say I keep saying Latinos, but it could be any any community that you're that you're catering to. Um, if you have a, a story that relates to them, just offer that story as an exclusive for them. Um, next slide. So now we're going to go to another poll question. 
and um, I need for you to tangle with me on this one again. So what are your ways to stay connected or build that relationship with that local media that you're trying to reach? The first one is, well, you email them every time there's a story that you want them to cover. So maybe you email them and call them, hey, we're having an event on Saturday at 7, please show up. Um, they are in your media list. So every time you're sending a press release, well, they're getting, they're getting the press release um, through, through that email list. And the, the third one is, well, you basically just do not know how to reach them, and, and that's why you're um, listening to this webinar right now. Okay, so the majority is saying that you um, email them or you call them and let them know that you have a story for them to cover. Um, the second one would be then that um, they, they have they're in your media list, so obviously they, they get the they get the emails when um, when you send them out. And then the last one is that you don't really know how to reach them, and that's why you're in this webinar. Okay, well that sounds that sounds good. Thank you so much for answering um, our tango. Thank you for dancing with me. <laughs> um, we're gonna go to then things that you need to think about. So something that I do that it's like I I I mean one on one meetings I do not I am nobody without those one on one meetings. Um, one on one meetings and it means exactly that you and somebody else and then that person from the media outlet. Um, these are really important meetings for you to have, and Adam was mentioning that. This is like the dating that, that he was talking about. Um, but it's dating, obviously, somebody that you want to date, um, meaning you're really interested. You, you don't want them to just ask about you. You're the, you're the reporter in that sense. You're the one that's constantly asking um, all these questions very casually. You're not bombarding them. It's, it's not like... Um, it's not like an interrogation. It's a very casual conversation, definitely a, a meeting that you're trying to do either outside for coffee or maybe in their in the station or their, or their offices if there's time. Um, they could just give you, let's say, 30 minutes um, meeting. And you really want to just get to know more about them as a human being, um, like, uh, well, they're reporters or they're journalists. So did they go to school for this? Why did they go to school for this? Something must have happened that was like, oh, my goodness, this is my calling. I need to do this. Um, maybe they, um, they they belong to to a journalist organization that they would be able to give you contacts with. Um, and I'm always, because of healthcare, I always just ask them if there is, again, this is a very casual casual conversation, and maybe if you'd like to practice before, that would probably be a good idea. Um, but I'm an extrovert, and I'm, I'm totally curious. So to me, it comes very natural. So if it doesn't come natural to you, I would strongly suggest to practice. Um, but one of the questions that I ask is there's anything healthcare-related to their lives, maybe um, their children or their parents or their grandparents or their best friend. Somebody might, might have some kind of health story that could be related back to what we do. And um, this is something that's very, um, it, it has helped me a great deal. There's some reporters that really we just have a personal connection now because they've told me the struggles that they've had when it comes to, to health. Um, and because we do things related to the ACA, we really get in touch with, with, with those kind of conversations. Like maybe they didn't have health insurance before, and now thanks to the ACA, they do. Um, sending occasional emails to say hello, it, it's, a good, it's a good strategy. I'm not saying to, um, to bombard them with hello messages, but every so often, even if like, that's not something that you would remember, sometimes I call somebody or email them just to say hello, and I put it on my calendar the next two months to just reach out again and say, like, hey, um, and I was thinking about our conversation about, I don't know, your, your girls, um, you know, doing ballet, and I knew that um, they had a performance. Tell me how it went, and, oh, well, I, I wanted to know more about what you guys are working on, um, and then you could do a casual reach. So um, just sending them an email just when you need them, like, that's probably not the best way. Um, Adam also was talking about tweeting. Tweeting is really, like, I love Twitter. Twitter is such a great tool for many things, but to reach reporters, um, it's always very important. They tweet their stories, so you really could just go follow them and then just look at what they tweeted, read the story. You don't have to do a whole um, research on it, but just 
casually read the story and then retweet the story and then let them know, hey, this was um, read this great article by hashtag, um, you know, by at whatever the name of the reporter is. Those are a good technique. Also, um, going to the local chapter of, of journalists organization like the National Association of Hispanic Journalists or the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, they also have an LGBTQ association and different associations, the Asian Pacific Islander Association. Um, anyway, so maybe try to find out the chapter um, leaders in your community and see if maybe you would like to, if they will invite you to one of their events, that you would be able to talk more about what is it that you do. Maybe there could be a presentation or something to that effect. Next slide. So how to improve um, the relationship that you have with them. Look at her. She's like, mm -mm, I do not like that smell because they could just smell when you are desperate to get their attention, right? So you might not, you might, you might have not done any one-on-ones with them, so they really don't know you. They might have never seen you. Um, you just, you just send them um, emails, a press release, and then you just call them to see if they got it. But there's really like no connection, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I have this event at three o'clock. Make sure you come up. They'll be like, no, there's other events going on. Why would I care about your event? And and why do you always call me only when you need me? So it, it's a it's like a like a relationship. It can't just be about me needing you. It has to be about how can I help you do your job better. Um, and these are good options. This is a great story that you want your name on. And obviously, we're not going to say it that way. But um, basically, just make sure that you're not just reaching out only when you need them. Now, talking about like the the examples of um, of outlets that just want money and they never they never give you any action, I would strongly suggest to just keep persistent, even if they show no interest. And one of my examples is that we had a communications director, a great communications director. Um, in Georgia, and she would reach out to the Univision station there. And um, they just never, they, they always wanted the salesperson around, and if we, you know, we would reach out to the news team, and then the salesperson would reply back. Um, so it was really uncomfortable, but our communications director persisted during the first open enrollment period. We got not a single clip from them. Second enrollment period, we got nothing from them also until the last week of open enrollment that they did a six-part series story about the ACA and how health insurance could help the community. Um, so that was, that was just great, great success. And, it, you know, like our, our history told us that they were just not going to do anything. And they haven't been super active either lately, but um, we still send them things. We still, I still engage with the, with the reporters and the producers via Twitter, just in case if they, when they are ready to do health insurance stories, like they know that we are the experts and we can help them. Also, ask other leaders in the community. Maybe there's um, uh, leaders in the, in the community, like the Haitian Creole community in Miami or um, the Somali community. Um, the tribal community that maybe they would be able to be somebody that would be able to introduce you to that outlet or to the um, the leaders in the in the outlet that they would be able to to know that you that you can help them with their stories. So best practices. Next slide, please. Make sure that you do one-on-one -on -one meetings. These are key. I cannot emphasize how important one-on-one -on -one meetings are. Um, they are uncomfortable to book. If you call 10 reporters, maybe you'll book one. Um, maybe you're lucky. Maybe you'll book five. But that one that you book is going to be very important for you. And then after you do the first one, it'll be easier to, to get the rejection of no, I am not interested in meeting. Um, some of them will just completely refuse. But others that like you could send an email and be like, oh, I, I would like to meet with you. Um, I have... You know, maybe if you know their calendar, maybe they start work at 2. It's like, oh, would we be able to meet at 1 on, fr on Monday or how about next week Wednesday? So just give them options and see if they'll be able to book a one-on-one -on -one, um, meeting with you. Start following them on Twitter after that. And also if they have a public space on Facebook, 
um, reach out to multiple people within the organization. So not just the same reporter you see um, out and about doing stories, but how about the assignment desk editor? How about the editor, um, if it's a print or the producer on radio? Just try to get different ends within the same organization. Um, also, let them know that you have a speaker when you have an event. Um, or you want to book an interview, make sure that you, you let them know that you have a speaker of the language that they deal with. Um, in this case, I put Spanish. Let them know that you have somebody that's available, and obviously that person trained to give interviews. Um, ask other leaders within um, their own community to see if they would be able to introduce you to other people, and persist. It does not matter if they show no interest. I would say just keep, keep at it. Don't only just send them the press release. Make sure you call them and let them know that they got the press release. Call them again to let them know that the event's happening tomorrow. Is it, is it on your bucket so they would discuss it tomorrow morning? Call before their editor's meeting. Call them and ask them, hey, when's your editor's meeting every morning? And they'll tell you it's at 9 or it's at 9.15. Great. Call right before and say, hey, um, can you make sure that you guys can discuss X event that is happening, it's really important for your community. We're going to have a Spanish speaker there that would be able to give you interviews. And I have great visual. Okay, next slide. So how to identify your spokesperson. Now you know that you have, you're maintaining the relationship with the outlet. Um, you guys have great relationships. So now how do I give you that person that would be able to speak on behalf of our organization or our coalition? First thing, um, it does not have to be the leader of the organization. Um, unless, like, your organization is, like, three people, then I would probably suggest, yeah, that would be a good thing for all of you to be media trained. Um, but it does not have to be the leader, although it could be the leader. That is absolutely no problem. But when you're, when you're choosing your spokesperson, you need to think about who is the best um, speaker and who can explain the situation in, in that particular interview, but also stay on message. Um, it's a skill to be a spokesperson, not just because you are um, the highest person or the person that's constantly talking to the community. You might not be the best speaker. So there's a, there's a combination of different things that you need when, it, when, when you have a speaker, a spokesperson. So they, they're the leaders, right? The person that's a spokesperson is the leader because they have the strength, right? They, they command um, authority. They are warm. They have that warmth that when you see them, you see a picture or you see them on camera or you hear their voice on the radio, you're like, man, they, I, I trust what they're saying and they're reliable. Um, also, make sure that, that if you're, let's say, that your leader is the one that's always giving the, um, the interviews in, in English, per se, then make sure that you have somebody within your organization that speaks the language of that community and train them to be good spokespeople. So it'll be always good to have them. Here I have two examples. On the left, you can see Rosy Mota. She is in our Enroll America Houston, Texas office, and she is there with the Univision station um, talking about the ACA. And um, this is like a partnership that we have with that particular show. It's called... Um, Conexion Texas or Connection Texas with Enroll America, um, and 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 you just see her. She's well, she's well dressed, and she just looks kind. And if you hear her, you'll see that she is warm, but she has authority. And also on the left, on the right, you'll see Jose Medrano. He's from our Rio Grande Valley office, and um, also well dressed. And he has our banner in the back. He makes sure that our banner is showing um, when he gets interviewed. And he just commands authority. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And he says it in simple terms for the community to know um, what they need to know in order for them to get health insurance. Next slide. So you'll see our work in action. There's more going on here. You can see on top, the two top ones are print. On the, on the left-hand side is the Columbus Dispatch in Ohio. Um, this is our big get covered. I think it was a phone bank, but that was happening. This is front cover of the Columbus Dispatch. Um, you know, we send advisories. We call. We make sure that they showed up, let them know what was going on, explain them through so they could visualize that the event was great. 
um, also making signs. We, even if we don't have a printed sign, we make signs that you see there to make sure that, that it's visually appealing for them. On the right-hand side, it's the Outsmart. It's a Houston-based um, magazine. It's a partnership that we have with them, and this is an LGBTQ magazine. And on this one, it's um, an article that we actually wrote for them uh, talking about how the ACA now relates to um, newly married couples, um, thanks to the, um, the Supreme Court case in last summer that now married couples could, could qualify for an SCP or a special enrollment period. On the bottom, you'll see two um, TVs. On the right, this is also in Ohio, and this is a phone bank that we had um, that was very successful. And then on the, on the left-hand side, it says Contigo in la Comunidad. This is Univision 23 in Miami. This is not, this is a partner of ours that we've trained to do media, and um, he just went there and, and did this whole segment. I think the segment was like for um, five minutes or so, and it was very informative, and he is just talking to the community. So you also see him well-dressed and really informed, practicing his um, talking points, which is something that is very important when you have a spokesperson to know what the message is. Next slide, please. We're almost done, guys. <laughs> so now you have the spokesperson. Now you know how to meet the media and have great relationships. How do you make your media list? Well, I would say I could Google that for you, but you could Google it yourself. Um, it's really simple. If you don't have a media um, list, it's just as simple as Googling them to get their website and just go where it says contact, maybe newsroom. If they don't have that, because sometimes they really hide that kind of information, um, you can make, there must be like some um, phone number that they have, and you could just call that and ask to be transferred to the newsroom and then just let them know what you need. I just need to add you to my media list. Which one is the best email and phone number to call you? Can we call you directly to the newsroom? That would be one. Another trick, um, sometimes I just get people from, the, from, the, um, from Twitter. Like if I know that there's a reporter, I, I watch the news, I saw it, and, you know, on the bottom it says the name, Stephanie um, Gonzalez is the name of the reporter, and it says WRTZ, then I just Google, I just tweet. Um, go on Twitter, look at it, see if she has her, um, definitely follow her, and then see if she has, like, her email address there. If not, do exactly what Adam said. Just tweet at them, say, hey, I need your email address. Um, can you send it to me? And they most likely will. Um, also, if you're looking into in, uh, adding and just expanding, like, I totally understand you might be in a community that you're not part of, and you, don't, you just don't know what kind of newspapers they read, you could just go to a supermarket. Go to the supermarket that has, um, like, all the Latino, uh, a very Latino supermarket, or maybe, like, an Asian-specific supermarket, and go and just pick up their newspapers. Um, you might just be able, even if it's in Chinese, you would be able to see some kind of email or some kind of phone number that you would just be able to call and let them know that this is what you want and how can you get it. Now, creating um, an, uh, your media list, I, if you don't have like, a, like an email address from your organization, you could just get an address, just address book on um, Gmail. I used to have, um, when I used to work in another organization, I just put everything on Gmail. And if not, then you could, um, on your own address book, just put media, let's say you could put Latino media, and then just add all those emails in there. So when you send it to them, BCC, make sure you don't, um, put it to anybody. Just make sure that you blind copy everybody that you're sending this to because you don't want them to know who you're emailing to. And um, also, I would just say, just for backup, have an Excel sheet if you know how to use those. If not, just open open Word doc and just load up all the information. Name, um, organ, um, outlet, phone number, email. When do they work? Do they work on weekends? Do they work on weekdays? That would be something that would be important. Okay, lastly, um, this is how Enroll America could come to your rescue. Next slide, please. We have our communicators program. You could go to enrollamerica.org back, backslash communicators. And um, the communicators program is a weekly email messaging update. Um, you would get in that, you will get some talking points, earn media best practices. Sometimes we have examples of how um, one of our partners did an interview that was great. 
Um, we'll show those there. Also, we have um, messaging resources, localized messaging resources that we offer for you, and also even social media content, maybe a tweet with graphics, and they're like, hey, it's, um, it's Father's Day coming up. This is a tweet that we have, and you could just modify that in your own way. All of this is for free. This is, um, right now we have it in English, but depending, every so often we do a webinar call um, in Spanish. We do have an English, a, a monthly call in Spanish every so often, and it's just to practice your talking points, practice your interview skills, and any kind of questions that you'll have when it comes to how to connect with the media. So if you're interested, in enrollamerica.org backslash communicators, and you could just apply there again. This is totally free. And this concludes my presentation. I appreciate your time listening to us, and I will give it back to Erin. Great. Thank you so much, Annette, for all of that great information. Um, up next, we have Lorraine Ryan. Lorraine is the Public Affairs Officer at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in Region 3. Lorraine, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, anyway, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Lorraine Ryan, and I'm the Public Affairs Officer for CMS Region 3, based here in Philadelphia. Uh, my goal here today is to share some thoughts, insights, and tips on working with members of the CMS Regional Office staff to reach and attract media to promote your activities and programs. And believe me, we view these opportunities to work with you as being very mutually um, beneficial. So on this slide, um, we have a list of the 10 regional offices which are located around the country, each one focusing on different states. Um, each regional office has a public affairs officer like myself, as well as regional external affairs teams who along with others uh, work, uh, work with, uh, along with uh, uh, folks who work in the four CMS business lines. Uh, the map does show the regional offices as they're broken out the four regions, the ten regions as they're broken out by state. Um, however, what it doesn't show are the corresponding cities where the regional offices are located. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but I do have a slide at the end of my presentation uh, that shows the regional office media contacts with the cities that they're located in. So I'm not going to, um, I know we're pressed for time, so I'm not going to bother mentioning them here, but you'll see them at the end slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the regional public uh, officers view opportunities to work with our external pop, uh, partners like yourselves as being mutually beneficial um, because it is. Uh, in fact, we are very well used to working with external partners on many, if not most, of our major initiatives. And not just the regional public affairs officers, but also the regional external affairs teams with who we work very closely. And that's because we, re we recognize the value of local in getting media attention for us Having partners who know the local landscape, especially in communities where we're not ourselves located, we consider that to be a real bonus. Working with community-based partners uh, does have the potential to give us uh, access to the kinds of on-the-ground facts and insights that appeal to local reporters. And you're also a great resource for helping us illustrate local impact or consequences of programs or program-related issues. Now, there are a range of ways we can collaborate, uh, many, more than that are listed here, but I did list here some ways and examples of how uh, I and my colleagues have worked or can work with you or other external partners in the realm of media to promote CHIP. So uh, leveraging each other's media contacts. Well, um, while we have access to media databases that do allow us to research outlets, reporters, and producers for a particular area, you may have the relationships already established. So that would be a very uh, great way to connect with us uh, and we can work together. Or you may have a better insight into which outlets are the most receptive to a story or which is most read, viewed, or listened to by the communities you want to reach. So that kind of local intelligence is really something we can't necessarily get from our research databases. Leveraging social media capabilities. Well, here I'm going to tell you a dirty, dirty little secret. Um, CMS regional office folks do not have access to our own social media accounts. Uh, that may be shocking, but it's true. Um, our uh, CMS uh, um, communications group in our DC office are the ones that have the social media platform access. We do not. But you probably uh, have your own media, social media accounts, and that can be a big help to us. I'll give you an example. Uh, during uh, previous marketplace open enrollment periods, 
uh, partners uh, help push information about education or enrollment events using their social media platforms, which was very effective in driving awareness and attendance, and we couldn't do that on our own. So that was a, a great way of working together. Uh, testimonials. We've already spoken about the power of properly vetted personal testimonials, and we in the regional offices are often scrambling to find good stories to tell. You can help uh, us with the human interest angle by putting a face to a program or an issue, uh, which is, as we already discussed, one of the most compelling ways to both sell and tell a story. Back to school campaigns, I, I heard that there's, gonna, there's a toolkit that's about to come out uh, for the back to school campaigns. Well, for us in the regional offices, um, summertime is sort of a downtime in terms of Medicare and marketplace activities for the most part. But probably it's a great time uh, for some of you to plan your uh, back to school campaigns. And it is a great time to reach out to the CMS uh, regional office to do some brainstorming and maybe discussing ways that we can work together. Uh, chip in the marketplace. Um, now is also a really good time uh, to think about and plan ways to connect or amplify chip awareness and enrollment with marketplace related outreach. We may be planning for the upcoming uh, open enrollment period. Or even better yet, uh, we can talk about ways to collaborate on um, amplifying the message that chip and Medicaid enrollment is year round with the media. That's uh, something that's often lost uh, uh, in uh, to the media. And uh, that's a message that can be heard maybe better now than you know when competing with uh, the, the fall open enrollment periods. So that's another way that we can work together. Then there's phone banks and tell, or they're also known as telethons. And I'm talking about television and radio. Uh, they've been very successfully pitched by CMS uh, public affairs officers and our external affairs teams and our local partners, especially in smaller markets and uh, and with uh, ethnic. Uh, media outlets. Uh, we in Region 3 have had some success with Medicare and Marketplace, where we've been able to insert messaging about Medicaid and CHIP. Uh, we've done, for the last several years, um, phone banks in Philadelphia and in the Lehigh Valley, and we've always managed to get representatives of our partner organizations to talk about CHIP or Medicaid uh, while um, during the uh, interviews uh, that were conducted uh, during the uh, phone banks. My colleagues in our San Francisco, uh, Kansas City, and Dallas regional offices have had even more impressive success with pitching and getting phone banks, often with ethnic uh, media outlets, but not exclusively, and even specifically for, uh, for CHIP. Uh, so that's something uh, that we can certainly work on together. And finally, connecting with each other's partners. You know, we work closely with our regional external affairs teams in developing and promoting outreach education and enrollment events involving their partners. And we've seen the power of collaboration and leveraging in action. So maybe there might be opportunities to piggyback on or expand the scope of promoting events or activities or milestone events that we're planning or working on with our other partners uh, with some of you. So that's some way we can certainly work together. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I know that we've already gone over what are the most important elements or factors that go into successfully garnering media coverage, and I won't belabor them here, but I did want to call out some ideas and examples of how some of these elements have been used effectively or how they can be used to get a media win or enhance your media messaging. Uh, for instance, on human interest, uh, last year we all celebrated the 50th anniversary of Medicare, and here in Philadelphia we had a panel discussion of, uh, that talked about um, the history and evolution of Medicare, including Medicaid and CHIP. And working with our local advocacy groups, we were able to have in the audience people who could and did talk about the impact of Medicaid and CHIP on their family members, and that made for a very compelling story. And I know that many, or if not most, of our other regional office folks use personal testimonies at their events as well. Now, as far as timing and leveraging the calendar, um, in addition to focusing on back-to-school uh, think about the end of school and some of the out-of-school out of, out of activities that can make for a message or an event tie-in and get media attention to promote CHIP uh, enrollment, which brings me to joining forces with other community groups and organizations, which is also on this list. <clears throat> think about summer reading programs with community libraries, summer lunch programs organized by the school district or local so social service agencies or community groups, day camps or recreation activities hosted by the city recreation centers, the wise, churches, or other faith organizations. All of these activities might provide an opportunity to work with uh, community groups uh, and collaborate on uh, tying together the idea of you know, keeping kids healthy 
in mind, body, and spirit, you know, with enrollment information uh, that can be delivered in connection with these activities and might, uh, you know, help garner media attention, you know, by joining forces with uh, other activities that might be getting uh, some media notice. Uh, seeking tie-ins with local personalities or celebrities. Some years ago, um, I helped promote a chip-related campaign in Baltimore at a recreation center that had been adopted by the Baltimore Ravens. The event was attended by a couple of players, which created a lot of buzz and helped attract media attention. So local personalities that can attract attention is not limited to athletes, but can also include politicians or well-known community or religious leaders. And it also could be a member of the media, which leads me to the idea of making the media your partner. Many media personalities align themselves with causes or initiatives that have meaning for them or the news outlet. Uh, an example is that we successfully work with a popular radio show host on promoting a marketplace enrollment event where she and her station was making an appearance as part of a larger community event. And while she was there, she did live interviews with uh, CMS uh, regional leadership and some partners and giving them an opportunity to share their message. And she did promote the event uh, prior to her coming. So that was an opportunity there that could be uh, used. We also conducted a radio phone bank last year with a Spanish language radio station, um, and uh, it was used to drive folks to call a local marketplace navigator organization to schedule enrollment op appointments. So in addition to promoting the phone number and encouraging his listeners to call, uh, the popular host also did live interview uh, with partners and local officials to talk about the importance of getting covered and the availability of affordable, comprehensive plans. And our partners were able to provide um, uh, interview subjects who spoke Spanish. So that was a, that was a huge bonus. And that's a, something that we often lack the ability to communicate with uh, some community groups because we lack the linguistic abilities um, that are necessary. And then also media, uh, many media outlets get involved themselves in collecting school supplies to fill bags for students getting ready to go back to school. So maybe there's an opportunity to reach out to that news station or news organization to see if they would be willing to partner with you to add the importance of having health coverage when going back to school. Uh, you could stress the examples such as having the necessary vaccinations or checkups for school sports and activities. And you can supply information about CHIP for the backpacks and join the effort with the media uh, organization as a partner. So those are just a few examples and thoughts I had on that. Uh, next slide, please. So as promised, uh, here's a list of the CMS regional uh, public affairs officers for each region. I've included their phone numbers and their email addresses here. And as you can see, the cities are listed uh, where we are located. And you can marry that up with the uh, map of the uh, regional offices in the states that we cover. So there's a couple of things to note. Uh, our colleague in Atlanta, which is Region 4, just retired. And until she's replaced... Uh, our colleague in Dallas, which is Region 6, Bob Moose, will be covering for her. So with two of the largest regions in the, no in the number of states and populations, he's going to be a very busy man. So please have mercy and pac patience with poor Bob. And in Region 5 in Chicago, it's currently being covered by Greg McAllister, who's filling in for Liz Surgeon, or who's on maternity leave and is expected to be back sometime in the early fall. So that contact will likely uh, change uh, sometime, maybe in September. I'm not sure exactly when. And in addition to the media leads, leads in each regional office, you may also uh, already have contact with the external affairs teams that I referenced. Um, they are also an excellent resource uh, for brainstorming or sharing re uh, um, other partner groups that you can work with. And if you don't, uh, I'm sure that we in the uh, public affairs group can connect you with our colleagues in the external affairs teams, and we'd be very happy to do so, uh, and especially if you're looking for opportunities for collaboration. So that's what I have uh, to offer. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that we are very eager and happy to work with you on, on this. Uh, we have been mostly focused, frankly, on uh, Marketplace and previous to that Medicare. Uh, we do work uh, in the chip realm, but we welcome opportunities to focus more on that, especially when it's an opportunity to work with uh, community groups and uh, grantees and partners like yourselves. So that's it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Lorraine, for uh, speaking uh, with us today and offering that information. And we do hope that folks out there uh, do connect with their regional CMS offices. It's a great opportunity to partner on outreach and engagement, uh, especially during the open enrollment period. So thank you so much, Lorraine. Our, our next speaker is Melanie Hall. Um, Melanie, we want to make sure that you um, are also not on mute. Um, 
Melanie is the executive director of the Family Health Care Foundation, and we are getting some feedback on the questions to make sure and speak up on the call. So, uh, Melanie, if you can hear us, please um, go ahead and uh, we'll start with your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. You want to go on to my slides? So, as Erin said, I am um, the executive director of an organization, a nonprofit in Tampa, Florida. And we have actually been providing outreach and application assistance here in Tampa for our CHIP program, which is Florida Kid Care, for about 17 years. So over that amount of time, we've certainly, um, through trial and error, come upon some things that have worked well for us in terms of working with our media. And I think one of the most important pieces that you can put in place is to make sure that you are really planning your outreach and communication strategies with your coalition members, your community partners, um, making sure that all of you that are working toward the same effort have a very coordinated effort with the media. One of the things they don't appreciate is having a lot of different pitches um, from a lot of different community partners for really the same kinds of events or messages. So you really have a lot more power in numbers by joining together and um, trying to work on making sure that you're engaging the media as a collective. So some of the ways to do that is to focus on either new developments or, or some of your events that are likely to attract the press. An example for, for here in Florida is um, we just recently passed legislation that eliminates the five-year wait for children for our CHIP program. And that actually is going to be implemented on July 1st. So we are looking now um, to engage the press to talk to a family that was originally denied Medicaid that will now be able to enroll in July be able to look for some of those enrollment events that we can focus on those new opportunities for families. And that's something that we feel would be attractive to um, some of our media partners. And then you can also look for back to school events and um, flu season events and other kinds of timely events within the year that you can circle back with your media partners and pitch a good story. Also developing those talking points and sharing those among all of your community partners is really helpful to make sure that you're keeping that message consistent. You don't necessarily have to cite your sources, but it's always a very good idea to have those citations available if anybody's asking you where you're getting that data from. When you're looking at reaching out to those special populations, um, I just want to reiterate what Adam and Annette had said before about choosing um, the right person to reach out as well as the right spokesperson to speak to that particular population. And looking at um, both who will make the ask when and when and who's going to be sending out those press releases is really one of those times for you and your, your partners to leverage those personal relationships that you formed. It may be that I reach out to a certain television station that I have a great relationship with, but one of my other partners reaches out to um, Univision. So it sort of uh, is a great time to really look at who has those relationships and um, try to make sure that you're effectively utilizing them. Next slide, please. I won't go too much into spokespeople because it's really been covered well by other speakers. I would just like to point out that um, I think the most important aspect of finding the right spokesperson is someone who speaks with a great deal of passion. Um, I will give you, I think, probably one of the best examples is a um, pediatric emergency room physician that for years worked with us on media, and it worked so well because he felt very personally invested in children getting coverage, and he talked about watching parents struggle with bringing their children in and getting the care that they needed in the emergency department, but then getting... Um, either prescriptions or therapies or other things that were recommended for follow-up to keep their child healthy or to help them along in their recovery. And you could just see how crestfallen those parents were knowing that they didn't have the resources to access those services. So he was, he was a great spokesperson that really could come from a very, very genuine viewpoint. Um, another genuine viewpoint, obviously, are family members themselves. And the other sort of tip I would throw out is not waiting until you're asked to um, have a family member speak or to be interviewed, but 
but really to cultivate that, that list all year long. So as you are helping families to enroll and they have a very um, successful story either with their enrollment or with some needed services throughout the year that um, really resulted in a great health outcome for a child, those are the kinds of times that you reach back out to that family and say, would you be willing when we get the opportunity to do some media to share your story um, so that you have those, a list of go-to folks instead of trying to scramble at the last moment for an interview. And I think it's very helpful to have, um, you know, several families that you can reach out to and, and you, they've already been vetted and they're already comfortable. They, they know that you may reach out to them for that purpose, and it really helps um, build a story. You can go to the next slide, please. Just a couple of things of note in terms of holding press conferences or, or conducting interviews um, that I think are very helpful. And um, typically you hold a press conference when you have a very large announcement or the kickoff of open enrollment, or um, with CHIP you might have a press conference for something for a change in a law or, or something new that has, has been available to families. I think what's very important in a press conference is to make sure that it is extremely well organized. And some of the steps you can take to make sure that happens is to have a run of show and to make sure that each of the speakers have very specific time allocations. Make sure that the talking points that you have are very clearly defined among your speakers. So there's not a lot of repetition of information. And provide the detail for your speakers if they don't want to, if they don't have their own sources of data or they don't have specific um, community um, statistics that, that they're comfortable with, you can provide that detail and it helps them to feel um, comfortable when they're up in front of those cameras. And then lastly, stick to about four or five speakers maximum. I've been to some press conferences that go very smoothly, very well, and they've been organized well. And as a result, you get those reporters responding back to those entities again when they want to hold another press conference. I've seen other press conferences that um, potentially can go on for, for a very long time and have several not very effective speakers, and um, it really sort of defeats your purpose. So I think tightening up that press conference run of show is very important. And then when you yourself are conducting an interview, again, it's been, it's been emphasized several times about the importance of the relationship with reporters and, um, you know, with those folks that you're going to interact with on a regular basis, and that's absolutely true. But regardless of how comfortable the relationship and conversation is, please remember that you are always on record and don't confide something that you aren't comfortable with being in, seen in print at some point. It is important that um, you realize that the person you're speaking to is there for a job just as you are. And so try and make sure that, um, that you really stick to building a relationship with good, accurate information and, and the fact that you're genuine about this, but do remember that you are always, always on the record. And then probably the most important um, tip I can give is remember the ultimate goal of, of what you're doing an interview for is to make sure you're connecting the audience with your services and with allowing people to get to either you or to the websites that they need to get to to do applications. So trying to get your phone number, your website, the website or your CHIP organization um, included either in your interview or scrolled along, around the, along the bottom of the screen or included in a highlighted way in an article is very important to be able to drive the, that audience back to the folks that are actually going to provide them with that assistance. Next slide, please. And then, again, there are really um, dwindling resources out there to do outreach. So, you're, so doing earned media really can be a very important outreach tool to broaden your reach throughout communities. So along with the other mediums that, um, that Adam suggested, there are also some formats that may be important for you to look at within the local media that offer you 15- or 20-minute interview slots, um, either like on Sunday morning local news shows or on radio shows, where we've been able to do good in-depth um, interviews and provided a lot of information at one sitting. And at the same time, they also provide some question and answer formats where callers can call in. 
that's been a great format for us to use. And we've actually had very positive experiences doing those question and answer sessions. And then also, as was mentioned before, some formats seem to work better for some audiences. We have found great response with our Hispanic audience here locally through our radio shows that we've done, um, whereas the more the general public, less you know, specific audiences, that seems to have had great response through our local television stations. Next. We were going to show a little bit of an interview, but I'm going to leave that just in um, interest of time and, and to be able to um, be respectful to our next speaker. So if you want to go back and click on this link at any point, you certainly can. This was an interview we did last fall that may show you um, some of the things that we've spoken about today. And one of the things that you can do is really try to connect and combine efforts. So, for example, for the last two years, we've worked with Connecting Kids to Coverage efforts with their radio media, media tour, and that was combined with some paid radio ads at the same time. So we really got a lot of bang for our buck through combining those efforts. Next. And then um, finally, you can utilize a lot of that content from those interviews and really um, get a lot of mileage out of it after the fact. So prior to an interview or a media event, you can tee it up through, you know, promoting it through social media. You can follow up through social media by including links to those interviews. You can include quotes, photos, um, again, extending the life of those interviews or those events long after um, that 15 minutes that you were able to get some coverage. And then you can also then use those quotes from elected officials or families in some of your promotional materials um, outreach materials, it, it, pictures in particular, are, um, are really valuable as you, you go through trying to broaden and extend that reach. Next. Just want to thank you for your time, and I will stick around for the question and answer session, um, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much, Melanie, and apologies again for the technical difficulties today. Um, our last speaker is Elisa Camahort page uh, Elisa is the co-founder and chief community officer at BlogHer, and she's going to talk a little bit about how to engage with local bloggers to reach new audiences. Elisa? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'll just dig right in. So um, She Knows Media, just so you briefly know a little bit about us, is uh, one of the top women's lifestyle online networks. We reach over 90 million unique visitors every month across all of our sites and blogs and almost 300 million social fans and followers. And our primary brands are the She Knows brand, the BlogHer brand, and I'm one of the co-founders of BlogHer, and the Stylecaster brand, which is more focused on millennial fashion, beauty, and lifestyle. If we go to the next slide, we do a, a we have a series of core initiatives that are all about speaking to our mission of women inspiring uh, women. So it ranges every, everything from Hatch, which is our digital and media literacy program focused on Gen Z, uh, where we walk uh, tweens and teens through various curricula around media and the use of digital and social media, and then record unscripted video to sort of provide content to adults about what tweens and teens are thinking. We also put on conferences, the largest conferences for women online content creators and web influencers. And we have a series of uh, programs designed to encourage pro-women advertising, pro-women um, research and insights, and women entrepreneurs through the pitch, the F word, femvertising. Uh, so these are all initiatives we work on in addition to just being editorial and social sites. Uh, and it's all about reaching women, and particularly moms. They're one of our strongest demographics, um, obviously. So if you go to the next slide, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is to think about social media as um, not some monolithic block. Uh, people are not having the same mindset when they visit different social media platforms. So it's not um, really in your best interest to post the same thing everywhere as though all social was alike, and nor are people, um, you know, people's use of Facebook is somewhat ubiquitous, but think of it as a utility, almost like replacing phone service, 
And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only thing you need to do. And I think that's the second trap people fall into. So if we go to the next slide, what we've kind of outlined here is that there is a primary purpose that people have when we've surveyed all of our users, when they go to these sites. And thinking about how your message can fit into that purpose means that they will have the mindset to receive your message. So Facebook is still primarily the place we keep in touch with friends and family. Um, it's very much a, a, an identity-based social network. So it's people you know and the people who know the people you know, as opposed to if we skip to over to Instagram, the thing I find really fascinating about Instagram is that this is an interest-based social network. So it's um, sort of uh, people are coming together, not necessarily because they know one another, but because they care about the same things. In Instagram, uh, hashtags rule. Uh, unlike a lot of the other platforms where if you over hashtag, you're kind of annoying people on Instagram, the more hashtags, the better. Eight or nine hashtags is actually really recommended. And you will build audience and you will build a community around hashtags. So uh, using myself as an example, you know, the most common hashtags I use are around being a vegan, around my cat, and around my home garden um, because I have a house that has a garden for the first time ever. And you can see when you look at my followers that I have distinct groups of people who care about my cat, who care about my food, who care about my flowers. Um, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily people I know, but every time I use those hashtags, I build my community around those interests. And I find people who are talking about those interests as well. So there's a difference between identity-based social networking and interest-based social networking. And Facebook and Instagram are kind of the, the, the number one example. Twitter, over the years, has had a lot of different ways people use it. And I often used to say that Twitter has a bit of an identity crisis. I think the thing that really Twitter has become is a place for real-time conversation. This is where people come to see what's happening right now. And it's driven by either current events, think hashtag Ferguson, or entertainment, think hashtag uh, scandal. And this is not necessarily a place uh, where you're building a ton of just like general awareness even. It's, there's got to be a gimmick, sort of. There's got to be something relevant to right now. That's what people are going there for. Um, so think about how what you're doing can relate to something in the news, something that's happening, um, you know, whatever it may be. Try to get in on that real-time action because that's how you're going to get actual people looking at what you're doing. When it comes to Pinterest, I tell many, many people that, um, you know, if you're not about um, food or style or fashion or something very window shoppy and life hack for your home, I don't really think you need to worry about it that much. And the last point I would make is that blogs are really where substantive conversation is happening, interactive conversation, and people do like to talk about what they buy, what they use, what they go see, who they vote for. They're, they're talking about their choices every day and comparing notes. That very much happens in blogs still. And people trust bloggers that they follow because they feel, whether they've ever met them in person or not, they feel like they know them. If we go to the next slide. So the thing about bloggers is that over the years when we've surveyed bloggers, it has never changed that their number one reason they blog is to express themselves. Whatever else they're trying to achieve, they want to share their thoughts. But the, the purpose of the audience as blog, reading blogs has become more mainstream has really centered more on uh, the majority are looking to blogs to find useful information and better inform, be better informed. And you would think that maybe that's a disconnect between these bloggers who just want to talk about themselves and these readers who actually want useful information. But in fact, it's all that self-expression that allows the reader to feel like this is their friend, this is their neighbor, this is their, a person they can trust. That's the context of that human that makes them feel that connection so that when the blogger does talk about what they buy, what they see, who they vote for, what they're doing, the reader feels tr trust in that information, uh, the tendency to want to follow that advice. Uh, to, the, to the extent that when we did a survey around beauty information, we found that our audience would rather take beauty advice from a parenting blogger 
who was someone they really know, quote unquote know, than take advice from a beauty blogger necessarily that they don't know. So it's very much keyed into the human. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, so, you know, this is what bloggers know about why people will follow you. If you're creating content, and most organizations have kind of realized they need to create social content, you have to let them know you and provide some context about who you are, who, what human are they talking to. People don't actually like to talk to a logo or to brands or to organizations. They like to talk to people. Um, but they also want to get useful information, and they also want to, um, and when it comes to bloggers, they want reciprocation. So they don't want you to ask them to always read their stuff and link to their stuff and share your initiative without you coming and reading their stuff and getting, being a part of their community. The whole blogosphere was kind of built on this spirit of reciprocity, um, and that's still very important. Um, and there's something sort of unique about who you are and what you do, just you know, making sure to that, that that individual voice of the human and the individual um, service that your organization delivers and making sure that that's sort of something you keep front of mind, that only you do you. And that's what makes all these blogs find their place in the landscape. If we go to the next slide. So who are bloggers? They, they are not necessarily journalists. Most bloggers do not call themselves journalists. But they can commit acts of journalism. Just yesterday, a blogger I know, um, I complained on my Facebook that in a criminal case here in my area, in the Bay Area, they were sharing a senior high school photo of this perpetrator who had been convicted, actually, and not his mugshot. And I thought it was both, you know, it was, it was kind of annoying, making him, you know, look good. And so she spent all day kind of chasing down until she finally um, – got his mugshot from the local police department and posted it. And that was just, that's not her job, but she got sort of a bug in her ear and she wanted to go after it. So bloggers can commit acts of journalism, but they don't consider it their job. It's got to really inspire their passion. But just like the journalists that you heard previous speakers talk about, um, you should know a blogger's beat. You should know, if, if do they talk about health? Do they have kids? Are they concerned about access and affordable health care and all of these things? Um, you should kind of know if what you are hoping they will be inspired by is at all in their wheelhouse. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, there's uh, they are your prospective advocates. And some of them might be your prospective clients. And they speak to many, many more of their users. So there's like this dual approach when you're talking about bloggers. They could be your user themselves. They could be people you market to directly, but in doing so, you may inspire them to pass your marketing on to their readership. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, understanding the blogger and what motivates them is important. Some bloggers, just like some of the media outlets that someone spoke about um, on this presentation, then their motivation is monetary. They get paid to write sponsored content, and it's disclosed, and they consider it to be like advertorial, as it would be for any media outlet, and they are looking for those opportunities. But that's usually not all that motivates the blogger, and passion for causes is a big part of what a lot of bloggers express. Um, and by asking, you know, not just telling them, you're going to, this is important for your audience, you're going to want to talk about this, uh, it's more important to ask what really triggers them, what are the issues they care about, what kind of, um, what could you give them in return that would motivate them even more. And understanding what they already talk about is how you find your A-list. So a lot of people, when they decide to build relationships in the blogosphere, they um, – they just look at a list of, oh, you know, do, do, can we find the list of top 10 mommy bloggers? That's like the most common question I ever get asked. It's like, who are the top 10 mommy bloggers? And my answer is, well, they, I, I don't know, first of all, because it depends on your criteria. But second of all, they, it doesn't matter who they are if they would not be interested about what you're doing and never share about it. And so you have to kind of go check these people out and say, what are they writing about? What are they talking about? Are they fertile ground for my outreach? Uh, on the other hand, you can also proactively search who are the people who are talking about 
um, what you care about. If you're out um, in the blogs, who is talking about, for instance, their kids, affordable health care, health issues, um, you know, even lots of people right now in the political climate are talking about CHIP and they're talking about their experiences. So finding people who are already interested in this topic, that's your A-list because you've already fought the major battle, which is that you know they care and you know they care enough um, and it fits into what they blog about. Because, you know, bloggers do get into sort of a, my blog is about, is, is about this and I don't talk about this other stuff. Even if in life they care, that's the thing. So, and you can also be looking for these conversations on Facebook and Twitter. If we go to the next slide, um, but that's how you find your A-list. And, and um, so there are many different ways when you're outreaching to bloggers, many different ways to, to, to answer the question, what's in it for them? How can they participate? How can they be a, probably the least interesting outreach is to say, we're doing this thing. Here's a link. Will you write about it? You're going to get 99% no or 99% delete. Um, but what can they do? How can you get them actually involved? Can you bring them to an event? Can you introduce them to families you've helped? Can you ask them for their stories and, and want to share them, the crowdsource stories that would relate? Can you create some sort of hashtag that would celebrate some milestone or important, um, important topic? Can you create a challenge where you're trying to get people to – to donate, but you're collecting it, and maybe the people who um, get the you know you get the most of their followers to do something get acknowledged. Some it's two questions: How can they participate? How and be a part of it? And what's in it for them? Like why why are they besides satisfaction? I mean, there's you know you can always say well make them feel good to help, but you know I'm sure that there. Are, a thousand ways that they get approached and a thousand ways people can help. And it's all about kind of creating that personal connection and that, that sort of touch point. And someone talked about that earlier with um, journalists and, and trying to figure out if they have some relationship to the subject matter, um, which is great. And what bloggers do that makes it so easy for you is they're probably talking about it if they have some relationship to your subject matter. If we go to the next slide. There are some, um, um, you know, the things about bloggers is that they want to tell stories. Um, there has to be a story. And so sometimes they really do want to tell your story. They just want to tell your story. What's even better is when your story aligns with their story because that's what their readers are most interested in. Their readers know them, not you. So them telling your story is good. Them aligning your story with something similar in their life story is better. And finding that story is, is really um, the important thing. If we go to the next slide. So, you know, there are great examples of cause-based blogger advocacy, and you can find them. Uh, I listed one that's corporate, um, but the rest are actually charitably oriented. Shot at Life by the UN, one.org, um, Every Mother Counts, uh, Charity Water, uh, Speak Beautiful. Shot at Life, One, and Every Mother Counts, they all have advisory councils of bloggers, so they've identified prominent bloggers and and invited them to be sort of uh, ambassadors for them. Um, and Speak Beautiful is around a hashtag, and they created some really compelling video content and then uh, created it around a hashtag. And then Charity Water did a really interesting thing where they, they created a program where, you know, they ask you to donate your birthday, to ask your fr friends and followers if you're turning 38, to donate $38 to wish you a happy birthday. Um, so that's, and that's, I think, a great example of what I was talking about earlier, where you create some sort of milestone around which people can activate. And in this case, it's the birthday. Um, I think the other thing to remember is that there are probably uh, local bloggers congregating. If you're looking specifically for people in your geographic area, Facebook and Meetup still are really heavily used for people to create groups of bloggers and they usually have admins and you can reach out reach out and um, you can try and sort of reach out to an admin of one of those groups in order to reach more of those folks who are actually geographically um, related to you so um, I know I really rushed through all that because I know we're running long but I think that's my last uh, yes yeah, last slide 
say thank you very much. Um, totally reach out to me if you have questions, and I know they'll share these slides. Um, but I hope that was helpful. Yes, it was great. Thank you so much, Elisa, for all of that information. And thank you to everyone for sticking with us. I know we ran a little long today. Um, we uh, didn't have any very specific questions for our speakers, but the feedback we got was people looking for the slides after the presentation because the information was so great. So thank you to all of our speakers for sharing that great information with us today. Um, we will be posting these slides to the insurekidsnow.gov website in the next few weeks. Uh, so please feel free to follow up with us there. If you are not connected with us, you can go to insurekidsnow.gov to sign up for our e-newsletter, and we'll be sharing a link to the slides there as well. Or you can connect with us on Twitter at, I, at IKNGov. Uh, that's at IKNGov. And uh, please use the hashtag Enroll365. Love to hear what you're doing out there um, across the country and the good work you're doing to enroll children in Medicaid and CHIP. So thank you again for joining us today. We'll be following up uh, with this information on the website and by e-newsletter uh, and over our social media accounts. Um, and uh, we hope everyone has a great rest of their Tuesday. Bye-bye.